So I was trying to find how to record. No, ah, right, okay. <laughs> Got it. So yes. does this mean that iron is heavier than lead? Yeah. Iron is heavier than lead. Um, I don't know that it is. Oh, that's what they no, say. No, it's not. No, melting point, point of barium is 725. And iron is what? Iron will, must be uh, ooh, five I times less. The same. <laughs> The tenth, it would be seventy-two, so it's one hundred and forty. Is that right? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that'd be easy. Yeah, it'd be easy in, inside the melting uh, the melting point of barium. What's this? Reduce the solid temperature. Yeah. And um, Martin Shalders is supposed to be coming here. Mm. Pack 50p from him. <laughs> uh, the high gravity of the planets, we would expect heavy elements like barium to quickly fall to the lower levels. Why isn't it doing it? That's one of their uh, problems that they're not yeah. sure. That is, they say they don't know. Okay. It's so reactive, it, it does not occur in its pure form on Earth. But it can be purified and used in paint, glass making, to achieve a brilliant green colouring. Oh, hmm. so, really useful then. Yeah. So if if one scrolls further down, you can see more links if you want them. Okay. So that's a curious one, I must admit. And my next one I've got is this one. Why some people are mosquito magnets. Some people attract mosquito bites and others don't. So yeah, what, I'm afraid I'm the one that attracts mosquitoes and my wife doesn't. Well, you might like to read this article then. <laughs> so you've got uh, fatty acids emanating from your skin. That's the problem. You know, <laughs> it can be impossible to hide from a female mosquito. She will hunt down any member of the human species. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was CO2. Perhaps if everybody exuded DEET, they wouldn't get bitten. <laughs> uh. <laughs> there are many popular theories why somebody is a preferred snack. Um, it's a little so don't, eat, don't eat bananas. <laughs> yeah, don't eat bananas. Yeah. I prefer. Look to what this guy on the right is doing. Garlic or bananas. Being a woman and being a child. Wow. Yeah. And the reason is out there. Crikey. Right, moving on. It's a very strange website, the way it has these splits. Um, fatty acids on your skin. Fatty acids on your skin. Photograph, isn't it? Female. <coughs> <one thing. coughs> Eight participants were asked to wear nylon stockings over their forearms for six hours a day. <coughs> This was process were repeated on multiple days. Over the next few years, the investigators tested the nylons against each other in all possible pairings through a round robin style tournament. They used a two choice olfactometer, ESA assay, <coughs> that D over the uh, built, consisting of a plexiglass chamber, divided into two tubes, each ending in a box that held a stocking, <laughs> placed uh, the mosquito inside. The primary vector for Zika, dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya. Good heavens, I wouldn't have had to have that. <laughs> and observed as the insects flew down the tubes towards the, each other and so on. Uh, the most alluring target was subject 33. <laughs> it was four times more attractive than the, to the mosquitoes than the next most attractive student, a study participant, sorry. <clears throat> Astounding 100 times more appealing than the least. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The trials were de-identified, but didn't know which was what. So still they would notice that something unusual was afoot in any trial involving subject 33, because the insects would swarm towards that sample. It would be obvious within a few seconds. It's the type of thing that gets me really excited as a scientist. <laughs> The participants were sorted into the high and low attractors, and then the um, 
uh, scientists set out to determine what differentiated them. Right. So what's the answer? Substances in the sebum are used by bacteria. Da, 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 da. Hmm. Wow. So what happened? What was the answer? <coughs> Two classes of odor. Um, uh, Orco and IR. Infrared. To see if engineers could engine if they could engineer a mosquito to an unable unable to spot humans, researchers created mutants that were missing both one or both receptors. Well, orco mutants remained attractive <coughs> to humans and were able to distinguish the ones. The IR mutants lost all their attraction to humans to a varying degree, but still managed to find us. The results they were hoping for. Uh, <laughs> the goal was a mosquito that would lose all attraction to people or a mosquito that had a weakened attraction to everybody and couldn't discriminate. <coughs> so, um, exquisitely complex olfactory system. Hmm. It's a fail safe that the female mosquito relies on to, to live and reproduce. Ah, that's right. That's why was, she has a backup plan and a backup plan and a backup plan. And it's due to these differences. Oh, you're right. So no hope is that uh, the apparent unbreakability makes it difficult to envisage a future where we're not number one meal on the menu. Hmm. I can remember many years ago when they come up with all these plans on how they're going to get rid of mosquitoes either by irradiating the males and making them sterile yeah. and one of the things they came up with which never seemed to get very far was somebody had come up with this chemical they put into the ponds where the larvae grow and it reduced the surface tension of the water yes. so the larvae couldn't get up and hang there and breathe so uh, they would all drown. That was the theory, but that never seemed to take off anywhere. It detergent would be used. Yeah, they used, they used red oil and DDT yeah. and, and sprayed it on the tops of the ponds so it formed, it formed a film on the surface. Yeah. And the, the mosquitoes had to go through it. They tested it up at Porton. Oh, did they? And, uh, yeah, they, <laughs> they had a spray. <laughs> He had a spray system up there and they used to fly aircraft over and spray on this area up, up at Porton. Yeah. And uh, the, at the top of the top of the hill, they had a, a, a cone thing and it was, I think it was painted orange or yellow or something anyway. There was a new director came and he said, uh, that's an ugly looking thing. Can't we get rid of that? And somebody pointed out, no, that's the marker for the aeroplanes when they come over and spray the DDT. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can't really get rid of that. And then there was a there was a house up at the top there. Um, what's the place? There's a little village up the top anyway. And uh, this woman put the baby out. And when she went out, the baby was covered in little red spots. Oh, my God. So she rushed, rushed the baby down to the hospital and it was a spray. Because they put the red dye in to, to, to ah. so you can see it, and, and the plane went a bit too far, and it sprayed <laughs> over the house and it sprayed the baby. <laughs> and this woman was in the right panic because she thought this the child had a, had a rare disease. <laughs> but, uh, well, I guess uh, the DDT did much good to the baby. Yeah, well, the DDT is still there. It, it, it's it all all impregnated with DDT. The whole the whole area, the great big area there. Yeah, I'm thinking it's about gradu that. it's gradually decomposing to uh, I can't remember what they but there are there are some uh, it decomposes to other compounds and it's slowly doing that but they use a hell of a lot of DDT. They really I'm do. just thinking of you know, the poor baby. What they did to the baby? Yeah, the baby was full of, <laughs> full of but uh, yeah, but what that's one of the biggest the biggest mistake probably we ever made was was banning banning ddt the problem with the ddt is well they used too much and it was it was everywhere if they'd been more selective with it 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 would have would have been okay but it ended up in, in huge quantities everywhere
because it hadn't been controlled properly. Now, when they took it off the market and banned it, there were probably hundreds of thousands of people have died since then because of because of, bee, of malaria, but because it got no way of, of defeating it. Because mm. it wasn't the, the GDT that was causing birds' egg shells to be weak. Yeah, that's right, yeah. But if they'd, if they'd been more careful with it and, and, and had, a, had better controls, they, they could have carried on using it. And you had a balance there between, I mean, many, hundred, many, many hundreds of thousands of people have died since because yeah. they can't use DDT. I'm scared. I used to use DDT like there was no tomorrow when I was living with my grandfather. Yeah, yeah. We did an exercise up in up in uh, Scotland once, and we, we we had great big marquees up there, and they sprayed the whole inside was covered in this DDT dust. Oh, yes. God, blimey, it was everywhere. They got this great big blooming distributor, this blower thing, and blew this DDT all over. We were absolutely covered in the damn stuff indiscriminate use yeah, at least when, you wouldn't you, get bitten by mosquitoes <laughs> when you flew well, in yeah, Australia well, yeah. they used to make sure everything was dead by spraying you and everything else with DD yeah. in the aircraft that's right it nearly killed us <laughs> yeah absolutely but you managed to survive Ken and Richard yeah, yeah so we're all right you know we, we were lucky but uh, we we had we had cleggies as well. Let me get big horse flies. Yeah, uh, did it cleggies? It would affect them as well, wouldn't it? DDT. And we got oh, we got bits of bloody death up there. It was terrible. Oh, that sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. It was. It was awful. Yeah. We, we had exercises in Germany as well, and uh, I, I got talking to the farmer who owned the land, and uh, he he had everybody. He had all the different nationalities there. He had ca ca the Canadians, the Americans. He had us. All doing exercise on this bit of ground, and he got he made quite a bit of money out of it. He didn't cultivate it, so I said, "Why didn't you cultivate it?" He said, "Ah, mucker, mosquitoes. <laughs> it was full of mosquitoes, so the the farmer wouldn't go there, but we were allowed to." Well, Anna, can you tell me what roughly the amount of data through the internet there is per second? Oh, the whole, God, the whole Ethernet. Really? The whole internet. Oh, no, oh, it's a huge number, right? Trillion, well, it's the trillions. Um, yeah. This, I thought this chip, this um, this next chip, this clip, um, can transmit oh, entire oh. internet traffic per second. It says. How about that? <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a staggering achievement, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, oh, it's a photonic chip. Ah, one point eight four petabytes. Yeah. Yeah, is that what it is? Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, the speed record is a blistering 1.84 petabytes, as I call oh, it. Oh. Um, I can't, I can't have it after my name, can I? <laughs> it's hard well, to estimate. Most global internet traffic per second. Hell hard to estimate how fast 1.84 petabytes really is. Your home internet is probably getting a few hundred megabits per second, if you're really lucky. You might be on one gigabit or even one ten gigabits. One petabit is a million gigabits. <laughs> or a million big. Well, it's, it's twenty times faster than the ES Net Six, the upcoming upgrade to the scientific network used by the likes of NASA. Hmm. Have you heard of that, uh, Ken? ES. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, no, hell of a hell of a chip, isn't it? I don't know what the ES Six chip. Know. How do you make that then? Ah, oh, 46 terabits per second. That's a bit quicker still, isn't it? What is it? Oh. No, not petabits, is it? No, it's only terabits. Only no. terabits. Back to Dame from Petra. Yeah, yeah, I know. I realise that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the date of this? Uh, oh, no, it's only this month. Look, 11th of October. Just a month ago. I was going to say, it's in November now. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, an aside, really. Um, yeah. That was quite interesting. I thought this this thing. Right, yeah. Uh, One point zero petabytes per second. Somebody said he made it For reference, the global internet bandwidth has been estimated to be just shy of one petabit per second. 
meaning this system could potentially handle all of that at, at once with plenty of room to spare. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. The new chip is far from finished breaking records, according to the team, using a computational model to scale the data transmission potential. Claim it could reach uh, eye-watering speeds of 100 petabits per second. Reason for this oh, is our solution is scalable, both in terms of creating many frequencies and in terms of splitting the frequency comb into many spatial copies and then optically amplifying them and using them as a parallel source with which we can transmit data. Oh, gosh. Well, the I, was, I, was, I was moaning to talk to you the other day. I was getting three, three megabytes. Yes. <laughs> I got a, I got a line to them, and I don't know. I, I, is everybody else having problems with this blooming like uh, internet? It's absolutely bloody awful. My mind's all right, I think. Um, I Apparently, the shop the shops in Salisbury are having a hell of a job. Are they? Some of them couldn't op some of them couldn't open last last Saturday because they were the, the, the internet wasn't working, and they couldn't open the tills. Oh dear. <laughs> So apparently there's two sorts of tills. You can have a one that takes the card, and, and that's right. But but you have one that, you, that is is sealed until until you open it online. So you, you couldn't open the shops. I don't know how many shops, but that's what the bloke in McCall said. Oh, they ought to have backup, shouldn't they? Everybody. Yeah, but yeah, but they, you know what, what do you do if the system's off? Bloody awful. Yeah, it is. Right. That's one advantage of cloud. Huh? That's the one advantage of the cloud system. If you haven't got internet, you haven't got anything. That's right. It's terrible, isn't it? The it's the it really is serious. Ever invented, that, in my opinion. Yeah, they were only taking cash. Yeah. They said we were lucky because we didn't. We could unlock our till at least, but we couldn't take any cards because it was off again. Every Saturday they have that trouble. Apparently, oh. awful. I got in touch with Talk Talk. I had three three megabytes. I think I did it. Uh, and I, I, you got you get talking to this bot, don't you? And you, you're typing typing to each other messages yes. to each other. So anyway, we we, we got we got typing to each other, and eventually this thing said, "Oh, I'm very very sorry. We're, we're extremely busy. We can't contact you. We can't be in contact with you anymore. Ring again tomorrow." Bloody hell! Great. So I came off I came off the off the phone. I looked at the internet and it got up to 60. <laughs> you know, a bit of a coincidence that, wasn't it? Yeah. Went from 3 to 60 immediately, but only after this phone call. Oh, I see, yes. But they never admitted anything. They never said anything. They never said it was off offline or anything like that. <laughs> Who, who, who's the supplier of the internet? Talk, well, I go, I'm talk talk. But well, they've got a problem now. Which is got, pretty rubbish. Well, do you they've get off the Yeah, they're bloody awful. But the trouble is, you've got to change your email address and all that, cape, and I, I don't want to do that. Uh, well, I, I've changed mine, and I don't have to, didn't have to change my internet. Or uh, if you change your, uh, they keep they keep the um, your, your number, don't they? Your, oh, if, you, if you've got a BT one, or uh, yes, yes, that's very true. Yes, they do. You have to keep paying it on the old one. Yeah, and then you have to change a new change a new one. So it, it you know, it's, it's get ridiculous. Yeah, if you've got your own, you don't have that problem though. Yeah, yeah. Talking uh, of things like that, did you see Alice Roberts' uh, uh, the, uh, destruction or construction deconstruction of the the credit the credit card and how it all works? All right. And all the safety measures they put into it, and for right. a simple little card. Uh, there's an aerial in there, for instance. When you do the uh, tap, tap it on the thing, it instantly, uh, what it does is the aerial inside gets powered up by the whatever, and it sends a message up to some computer up wherever it is, and it all comes back again. Uh, yeah. All within 300 milliseconds. It has to do quite a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but that's a program that's quite interesting, I thought, last night. I came across oh, it by sheer oh, chance. Up. Yeah, uh, Alice, Alice Roberts. Roberts. I think that's her name, isn't it? Professor Alice Roberts, the mathematician. Yeah, she's the, the archaeologist. Oh, no, it's the wrong one. The one with the red hair. They're both got red hair. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No, Alice Roberts is an archaeologist. Yeah, not that one. Sorry, got she the wrong one. She specialises in bones. 
the name, what's the name? Oh, the same program was on how it's made and they showed you them making them in America because they're nearly all made in America, apparently. Well, there was uh, one There was one company in Britain that she went yes. and had a look at and that was on. That was, it was fascinating. Anyway, um, moving on yeah. to another puzzle. This guy here is writing a nice equation. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but um, this is Professor Pavel Kruper. They found evidence of an alternative theory of gravity. How about that? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, they've discovered puzzling uh, behavior of star clusters that defy the current understanding of gravity at cosmic scales. Uh, says, although it's since been superseded by Einstein's gravity, Newton's law still holds pretty well. Well, we all know that. But now new observations have made made that don't quite fit these currently accepted models. Right. Anyway, um, uh, these clusters have a relatively short span of life before they dissolve. As the stars drift into two tails, one in front of the cluster and one behind, According to Newton's law of gravity, it's a matter of chance in which of the tails a lost star ends up. Both tails should contain about the same number of stars. However, we are able to prove this is not true. Or in the clusters we study, the front tail always contains significantly more stars than the rear tail. In the past, it's been tricky to determine which of the cluster stars belongs to which tail. <laughs> but the researchers on the new uh, developed a method to do so called the Jaroblokov Culver Compact Convergence Point, CCP, and this was applied to data of four open star clusters. To their surprise, they found that all four clusters had the leading tail far more stars than the trailing one. So the team then simulated the movement of stars in these clusters according to different hypotheses, known as the Modified Newtonian Dynamics, or MOND. <laughs> Essentially, this model suggests that gravity's effects are stronger at low accelerations than they are in Newton's laws. And intriguingly, this model predicts lined up predictions lined up well with observations. So, put simply, according to Mon, the stars can leave a cluster through two different doors. One leads to the rear tidal tail, and the other to the front. However, the first is much narrower than the second. So it's less likely that the star will leave the cluster through it. Da, da, da. Um, Newton theory predicts that both doors should be the same width. So I don't know what these graphs are about. Direction of motion, light years this way. Yeah, I see. Uh, and light years this way. How can you have light years on both scales? Oh, well, um, well, these... That's going backwards, not going yeah. forward. Yeah, they're not. Uh... I haven't got a zero where you'd expect to see the zero on the right. Zero, zero, there. Right in the middle of the... And the same on this. Yeah. And they've got colours as well, just to be... <laughs> but that explained it. Top graph of the distribution in the high AD, high AD's cluster as seen in astronomical observations. And below a computer simulation shows a similar distribution, it says. Um, this isn't the only way in which the MOND model fits the real world observation better. Star clusters in nearby cluster galaxies have been found to be dissolving faster than Newton's laws predict. It will be a natural byproduct of MOND. Another dark uh, major implication could shake up astrophysics if it is true. Then dark matter wouldn't exist. That would help, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, that would be very useful. <laughs> this mysterious subject conjured up in the 1930s to explain discrepancies. Hmm. A lot of work I was looking for that. If it doesn't exist, they'd be wasting their time, wouldn't it? Well, quite. Since <laughs> still dark matter is the prevailing theory because it does a very good job of explaining many observer, observed features of the universe. There's plenty of other evidence that points to its existence. Although there are many other observations support evidence supporting MOND, it remains a fringe hypothesis. Mm, right, so there you are. That's just a something you can get your um, explore a bit more. You can look into here. Mm. University of Bonn here and the Royal Astronomical Society there. Mm, interesting. Mm. Right, next one I'm going to look at is this is a, this is a, one of the, I think the link from that. This is an Oxford 
Oxford paper. This is the um, asymmetrical tidal tails of open star clusters. I don't know what this word pra means. The tidal threshold. That's what it means. Um, anyway, uh, oh, it says down there. Thank you. Yes. I thought you just knew it, Ken, for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so. Why don't they just call it the tidal threshold and everybody will know what they're talking about? Yeah. Pra is a shorter word, isn't it? <laughs> it wouldn't sound so smart ass, though, would it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you supposed to pronounce it, I wonder, with an, an acute A, accent on A? Ah. Mm. Anyway, it's probably some Polish or something. Right, a novel, this one is interesting, um, novel rule-breaking uh, material behaves like conductive Play-Doh. come across that sort of thing before, I think. Um, this order, one, but size is well in this one. I read this one. Uh, researchers' oh, trial right. creation is likened to a creator. Materials that conduct electricity, such as that, that, that ha tend to have some things in common. They consist of neat rows of atoms uh, and so on, which are thought to be crucial to allow electrons to flow through. Uh, University of Chicago researcher is exploring other possibilities. Based on molecular strings made of carbon and sulfur, interspersed with nickel, and they went to this team's surprise, the material turned out to be a very efficient conductor of electricity and was able to maintain its performance in a range of inhospitable, unhospitable conditions. Hmm. There already is some stuff in there. You you conducting conducting paste that you put in to to allow the current to flow, isn't there? When, I can't remember. No, you connect things together, you stick them together with this. Oh. I, I remember using it somewhere. I'm glad you can't remember everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we had this. It's a grey, grey stuff. That's that a brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be plasticine yeah. or play doh yeah. even. <laughs> play, yeah, well, it, it, it's the same sort of. It's like, it looks like play doh. I've never, never played with Play Doh. Pudgy. Yes. Oh, Play Doh's magic. I love it. Yeah. It is. Right, anyway, um, <laughs> this should not be able to be a metal, it says. There isn't a solid theory to explain this. Scientists say that the, the conductive material is unprecedented in the way it can be both pliable and conduct electricity. Um, it that's can... like a wire, that's pliable. <laughs> Conduct electricity. Mm, that's true. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Anyway, so through chemical treatments, I've been able to make conductors with organic materials that are easier to process, offer some flexibility, but their conductivity typically wanes under high temperatures. Oh, that's probably why it's better. Isn't it? In principle, uh, this opened up the design of a whole new class of materials to conduct electricity, easy to shape and robust in everyday conditions. Oh. We can think we can make it oh, 2D, yeah. 3D, make it porous, even introduce other functions, adding different linkers or nodes, said Mr. XIE. <laughs> it's a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you can melt it into shapes to suit different electronic devices. Well, interesting. I wonder if that'll ever play, catch on. Right, next one was cosmic and magnet recreated in the lab as an alternative to rare earths. So you are an alternative to rare earths. So that was that attracted my attention. Um, this is a, a, a rich in tetratani part something. Um, tetratani. Rare earth elements are a key part of electronic, but they're in short supply. Yeah, the way to create, recreate, to recreate a promising alternative, a cosmic magnet. Normally it takes millions of years to form a meteorite. It can be cooked up in the lab in seconds. Now, there you go. You see, many of our electrons, just uh, high performance magnets which are vital, da -da -da, da -da -da. rare earth deposits exist elsewhere, but the mining is disruptive. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so, what, let's see what they're trying to get at. Um, 
recycle the rare earths from old batteries or extracting them from sources of waste water. In a new study, investigated what prompted it called tetratinite. It was an alloy of iron and nickel arranged in a stacked crystalline structure. It gives it magnetic properties similar to those of rare earth magnets. The advantages of iron and copper and nickel are much easier to come by. Tetratonite is tricky to find. It mostly shows up in meteorite samples, where it's thought to take millions of years to form. So this is the point, isn't it? They manufacture it. Um, the team found that phosphorus was in the mix, helping to speed up the arrangement. So they mixed iron, nickel, phosphorus together in specific quantities and found that tetratinite formed up to 15 orders of magnitude faster, i.e. in seconds. No special treatment was required. We just melted the alloy, poured it into a mould, and we had it. Hmm. Wow. They, um, just like Delia Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's an interesting thing to keep an eye mind on for the future. They won't find think? much of it, though, will they? Well, they make it here, don't they? Just mix these yeah, things. Yeah, make it, if they can make it, that'd be right. Well, they found a dagger on Tutankhamun, didn't they? When they they did a did some X rays on the on the uh, on Tutankhamun, and inside against the body was a was a dagger. Yeah. And the thing was, it was it was. It was made of an iron that had not been invent wasn't invented for another thousand years. Oh, right. like the one in India, you mean that column in India? Yeah, like the column. But so the, the what, what? How the heck did this 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 happen? You know, how did Tutankhamun get this, and why was it put so close to his body? And they found it was it was meteoritic meteoritic iron that was so rare, but it had import been imported from somewhere else. Uh, but it was so precious and so rare that it was supposed to be cosmic, you know. Of course. So that's where he got it. Yeah, fascinating. Next to his body, and, uh, yeah. Right, I'm moving on to particles made from purified yeah. sand gain momentum from obes as obesity treatment. We all like particles, don't we, Richard? Silica. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you eat sand, it... Um, gets rid of your hunger, but you don't digest any of it. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you just pour sand in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah well, we've heard of, you, all, all heard of a sandwich. Yeah, when it goes to the beach, sandwich, and, yeah. you go to the beach, and every sandwich has sand in it. <laughs> a sandwich. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> silica. Silica oh, particles made from this will have blocked the enzyme activity to handle the body's uptake of fats and sugars. By hinting at the ideal design for optimal anti obesity effect. Hmm. South Australia builds on earlier right. exploring now in how endangered silica particles can impact the way the body absorbs energy from high fat foods. Ah, previous studies have shown mesoporous silica particles can drive weight loss in obese mice when added to their diet and can safely oh. be tolerated in male humans as a food additive. Only male humans, oh dear. <laughs> On the 2020 paper hinted at the best shape and size of particles to induce the anti-obesity effect. So porous silica has received yeah. increasing attention mm, as a safe therapy. Couldn't you just use cement? Certainly be, that's a weight gain, isn't it, cement, surely? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. They don't, have, they don't know how it works. So previously un it was previously unclear how it might work, I see. And the hypothesis the activity of enzymes. Polymerase. Mm. Joyce and his team designed an advanced yes, in vitro digestion model that enabled the, them to monitor lipid and carbohydrate digestion during a simulated high fat high carbohydrate meal. Hmm, yes. Can I move on down a bit? See what, oh, nothing else, let's see. Um, it, uh, complete preventable disease, yeah. Next step to validate these with animal models of obesity so we can determine any variation. Obesity is completely preventable disease. 
Mm. Like, yeah, more, more people in the world are obese than they're starving. Really? No. Okay. Yeah. Not believe it. Well, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a comic, comical spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what. I mean. <laughs> uh, who sent me this? I can't remember, but it's uh, it's the Guardian newspaper. And it's a bit of getting into. I think you sent me this, Peter. Did you? I didn't, Peter. No. Oh, right. Anyway, <laughs> that's a good idea. Um, smiling triggerfish to waving raccoon. A short <laughs> list of images for the 2022 Comedy Awards have been announced. Ah, right. So let's go through them. This is say cheese of a triggerfish looking into the camera. So that's that's amusing. And this one is yeah. the megalanic and Gen two penguin hanging out on the beach. Um, uh, talk to the fin. Oh yes, <laughs> that means something, I'm sure. Tight fit and eastern screech owlet tries to look out of the nest it shares with its mum. Oh God! <laughs> you don't see that at first, do you? <laughs> well, you get a shock if you saw that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's extraordinary. This one, uh, oh, yes. Uh, Three-month-old lion cub tries to descend from a tree. Obviously, not working oh. very well. That was well timed, wasn't it? Oh, sheepish. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fishing here. Uh, slap the bear in the face rather than be lunch. I <laughs> can't see the head of the fish. It's strange. He's followed it. Sorry? No. Where is the head? Is is it in his ear? No, it can't be. I think it must be the fish must be bent. I, yes, or it's um, the furrow there, isn't it? Might have disappeared into the furrow. Oh. Yeah, whatever. Um, that's an extraordinary picture, though. Yeah. Uh, this this is a bit of um, something I want to teach to my photographers. Uh, one at in um, practical photography, this type of image. But well, this is obviously a significant distance away from that. It's behind you. It's got a special name, that sort of photography. Yeah. Only one could remember what it was. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I think the word gestalt comes into it. Um, stop and stare, yes. That's a proboscis monkey. A monkey. This is a, a buckaroo, no, a zebra. <laughs> In Kenya. It's about to fall over. This wow. one sniffing the brown bear. Brown bear. Sweet little thing. Um, yeah. This one, ah, this is extraordinary. <laughs> Don't need to read that, do I? Good grief. <laughs> oh, turtles. Yes, the turtles. That's fantastic, isn't it? Making a bridge. Yes, but yes, it's extraordinary. I wonder why they were in a line like that. Well, they're on a log. Oh, on a log, are they? Yes, I see a yeah. log down. Oh, That's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> there we go. Oh, and this one. Very obliging. Lappet faced, lappet faced vultures. vultures. Just, just oh, amazing. Yeah. Aren't they pretty? <laughs> yeah, gorgeous. This, oh, yes, that's a clever one. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> that is fantastic, isn't it? Pegasus, yes. <laughs> wow. Love that. It's the Indian Saros crane drives an antelope away from its nest to protect Saros. its egg. Extraordinary. Yeah. And there's the uh, raccoon. Hi. Uh, <laughs> and this is a, <laughs> a throwaway item, you might say. Um, one of his play fighting. Queensland. Jesus. Um, this one, oh yes, this is keeping his head keep, and all has lost. Jesus. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, what's he supposed to be? Can I borrow Can I honey? Borrow honey from you until tomorrow? Mm. <laughs> no honey, yes. No, it's just not that funny, is it? Oh, that's the last one. Right. Okay, I thought you might just have a nice look at that. Next one is Electric Sparks from, oh, this is the um, thunderstorms. Apparently, sparks can be generated in plants, as these photographs prove, he said. Um, oh, yeah. Sparks coming out of the ends of there. 
So that is during certain thunderstorms, certain tree leaves can generate weak electric cold discharges known as coronas. New research suggests these coronas may influence surrounding air quality. Not, not for the better, presumably. Um, uh, <clears throat> lightning that, you? lightning yeah. tends to lead leads to the formation of several atmospheric oxidants, including hydroxyls. OH and hydroperoxyl. These okay. gaseous molecules uh, are crucial cleansing agents in our atmosphere. They can degrade de greenhouse gases such as methane. However, hydroxy radicals can also be unhelpful, producing high levels of ozone when they yeah, yeah. It's one of the, the ozone forms in the afternoon when oh. it's very sunny and you've got a lot of. Um, Pollution from cars, nitrogen oxide, and and uh, fuels. Uh, yes, yes. And it's anyway. about a hundred, a hundred different reactions before it forms. Gosh. And man. then it forms. A, these are hydroxy peroxide. Are um, the, the, the mesodors in uh, San Francisco? There's a, a a test for them. I got a test for them once. Oh, all right. And they lead to they lead to ozone, but the ozone doesn't form until about mid afternoon. And it, it can form a sort of bubble of, of, of air if the, if it's quite you know quite calm, uh, which can which can drift across and affect affect places quite a long way away. Mm. It's a really yeah really weird thing. This study estimated thunderstorms may account for up to sixteen percent of all global atmospheric LH. Follow follow work work has led researchers to investigate other ways that thunderstorms could trigger the formation of hydroxy radicals. Yeah. Um. Yeah. These reactions can lead to formation of ozone and other ones. Induce small electrical discharges on objects on the ground. These are known as coronas can be particularly prominent on plants with sharp points. So the question researchers will answer, answer was whether plant coronas generate measurable levels of OH. I see. In lab can natural ozone. Yeah, uh, researchers tested eight different kinds of tree leaves. The results revealed that these plant coronas did indeed generate extreme amounts of OH, whilst the volumes generated by plant coronas are significantly lower than what is found within thunderstorms. The researchers do speculate the size of large forests could lead to extreme levels of OH around the time of thunderstorms. I'm not quite sure what is after there. Even though the charge of generated was weaker, and sparks, the sparks and lightning we'd looked at before, we saw extreme amounts of hydroxy radicals being made. There are two trillion trees in areas where thunderstorms are most likely to occur. Mm. So there you are, it's another, another phenomenon you didn't know about. Yeah. And this next one, oh, this is, this is on the photography side now, we've moved over to camera. Oh, yeah, I've seen this one. The world's largest digital camera. Uh, 3200 megapixels. What's that? 3.2 gigapixels? No. Yes. All right. Only gigapixels. Am I wrong? Sounds right. Wrong. But, um, and here's the here's what it looks like. Um, the focal plane the images with the complete focal plane. The LSST. The future are. Oh, it's 11 o'clock. The clock might. Clock is chiming. These are the largest digital images ever taken in a single shot. Uh, one of the first objects photographed was Romanesco, which is this um, vegetable. Um, which we can see further down, I think. Um, yeah. There's oh, the, the, uh, the, 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 work, the working bits. Yeah. God, it's a lens mount. It is a lens, a huge lens mount, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, the images are so large it would take 378 4K ultra high definition television screens to display one of them in full size. 378. Mm. And their resolution is so high that you can see a golf ball from about 15 miles away. These and other properties soon drive unprecedented astrophysical research. So it's made up of sections, though, if you actually look at it. Yes, oh, indeed. It's not a single, single 
Chet, oh, that's yeah. the word for it. Yeah, you're right. 189 individual sensors, it says here. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, so the camera will produce panoramic images of the complete southern sky, one panorama every few nights for 10 years. <laughs> Fed, the Rubin Observatory Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Oh, dear. <laughs> A catalogue of more galaxies than there are living people on Earth and the motions of countless astrophysical objects. Using this camera, the observatory will create the largest astronomical movie of all time and shed light on some of the biggest mysteries of the universe, including dark matter and dark energy. There isn't any dark matter. Yeah, quite, yes. This is a huge milestone for us. The focal plane will produce images for the LSST that is capable of and sensitive eye of the Rubin Observatory. This achievement one of the most significant. Da, 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 da. Is there any actual images? Ah, here we go. This is what we want. It should work. I don't know who Vera was. Me. Um, wow, something, eh? Yes. Um, a little corner of it there, look. That's interesting. Um, 21 square rafts, each containing oh. nine sensors. Well, that's this one there, I suppose. Um, will produce images, an additional four specialty rafts. With only three sensors, and oh, that's one of these things. We'll use the cameras to focus and synchronizing a telescope to the Earth's rotation. Ah, I see. More to it than meets the eye. Yeah. The focal plane has truly extraordinary properties. Um, yeah. Pixels are very small, 10 microns wide. And the focal plane itself is extremely flat, varying by no more than a tenth of the width of a human hair. Hmm. Hmm. You could take portraits with it, couldn't you? <laughs> Why waste it yeah. on stars? <laughs> What's and all? 
<laughs> so, surely the point of it is to find out how many Romanescos there are in the universe. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, here's a field of view. Well, now that's what it looks like. What am I saying? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Earths wide. So here's a view from somewhere, and there's a golf ball there. Right. I'm sure that's exactly right. Um, 50, 50 miles away. Yes. Yes. Um, the specification is just astounding. 10 years of 220 billion galaxies. 20 billion galaxies. Hmm. Yes. There's more pictures. Another, another lap, time lapse thing. Let's click on that one, shall we? See what's what. Yeah. That's not the same. Red. Dust on the sensor. Blow it off. <laughs> Here's that one there. Oh, there you go. That's a uh, oh more. <laughs> um, that is amazing. It is. Um, I'm glad I. I'm sure glad I've amazed you with something. <laughs> uh, two foot tall, twenty pound rafts. The sheer size is impressive. Mm. There we go. This is how, that's how they're doing it. Look, somehow. Is he sitting cross legged? <laughs> He's in the lotus position. Not at all comfortable, is it? Taking the first images. Oh, I'm still going on with this thing. Um, the focal plane is placed in a cryostat while the sensors cool down and uh, negative. 150 Fahrenheit. Um, after several months without lab access due to the coronavirus. Oh, right. Um, uh, broccoli, apparently. Romanesco is broccoli. That's all. Yeah. Oh, of course, no. of course it is. Yes. Yeah. I've forgotten. Yes. Um, broccoli. There's a lot more to this article. How the lenses are going to work, look. Yeah, purrs. wonder if that'll have tilt and shift on it. They've got orange filters and so on. <laughs> they don't need it if they were... Oh, no, how the pin cap, pin hole can we wouldn't need it, would they? But um, they, this is a proper lens, I think. Yeah. Um, and the shutter. A filter exchange system. It says by mid SUV size size camera. Oh, it's big, isn't it? SUV, yeah, whatever one of those. Size. Um, there that it is. is. Definition of size. <laughs> yes. It's <laughs> usually it's usually whales or something, isn't it? <laughs> one one SUV. Click <laughs> <laughs> on the links below to explore the images. Oh, the links below. Are these links? These are not links, are they? This link. Oh, this link. Oh, I did something. Oh, I've got the viewer here. I haven't seen this. It's a broccoli. So we can go in. Oh, my God. It's a bit blurry, isn't it? Yeah, Am I yeah, imagining yeah. things? Perhaps I haven't shortened it. 
What have we done wrong? I'm assuming we've done something wrong. So it's just plus or minus here, yes. I don't know, that doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Huh. What's the next one? Um, Flammarian engraving. Uh, yes. Well, that's not impressive, is it, somehow? Doesn't seem to focus too well, does it? Yeah. I think we've got something well, uh, amiss. Perhaps because it's only a pin on camera and here we've got the... Uh... The collage. It should be... It looks blurred even at that scale, doesn't it? Look at this chap here. looks blurred all the time. Never once sharp. What was it? Don't quite understand what they're on about at the moment. So let's not to worry about it. Let's press on to the next. Oops. Diffraction rings, detail features. Oh, they're, they're all yeah. pinhole cameras. Uh, we're all done with the pinhole camera, weren't they? Of course. That's probably why they weren't sharp, Richard. Yes, indeed. Oh, they haven't done the lenses yet, have they? No, they haven't. No. Um, these these things are caused by small dust particles or tiny defects in the vacuum window. Hmm. They can see cosmic rays. I didn't know that. What happens? These yeah. occur in all astronomical images. Oh. They'll be masked out. Oh, clever. Oh, yeah. Um, see the signs. 600 the second paper. long to 10 minute exposure. Oh. Oh. Uh, compared to the 15 second exposures planned for our survey, I think that must be planned, yes. And the longer the exposure, the more the cosmic rays. Oh, I see. Yes. There's a circular reflection in these images of circular reflection coming from inside the cryostat. That's this curve here, is it? Light oh, from the man. telescope will be shielded or baffled by the full SST camera and should not reach this part of the cryostat. Well, there you go. That's all good stuff. It is. And that was all from this this SciTech Daily. That, that one was, and this one. Freak coincidence of the curious incident of the swarm and sprites at night time. This is when you're above uh, the, these things, above thunder clouds, thunderstorm clouds. Oh, the sprites. And they call them sprites, yes. Yeah, they go above the cloud, aren't they? They've just got to get above the clouds to see them. Yeah. And they're red. Um, mm -hmm. Scalar magnetic field okay. after reaching 0.2 nano something. What's T? Tesla. Tesla, yes. She's yeah. not very far with her sandwich, isn't she? That's what that. You need a bigger mouth, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, this this article goes on quite a long long article. Um, uh, so, what are the chances of somebody taking a photograph of this rarely seen brief transient luminous event um, at the exact same time as a satellite orbits directly above, with the event leaving its signature in the satellite's data? The likelihood of this happening seems pretty remote, but remarkably, an observer for the Czech diddle and dumb, who's also an avid lightning hunter, has taken photographs of these luminous events, which not only coincide with measurements taken by ESA swarm satellite, but also recording from the ground. These extraordinary three-way coincidences leading to better insight into how this type of lightning propagates into space and in addition these new findings could potentially improve scientific models of the ionized parts of the Earth's upper atmosphere, viz the ionosphere. So they just look like a little flash in real time I suppose. The time is at the bottom there, isn't it? Mm. Uh, transient luminous events uh, are optical phenomena that occur high up in the atmosphere. Inked electrical activity, uh, very brief, lasting from a millisecond to two seconds. Mm -hmm. There are several types of them around sprites, jets, and elves. <laughs> so there, yes, 
That's a good pub question, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a, a view from well, uh, artistic view, a swarm constellation over the ESA's first Earth observation constellation of satellites. These three identical satellites were launched together in one rocket. Two satellites orbit almost side by side at the same altitude, initially 290 miles up, descending to 190 miles over the lifetime of the mission. The third satellite in a higher orbit has a slightly different inclination. The satellite will orbit drift, resulting in upper satellite crossing a part of the lower at an angle of 90 degrees in a third year of operations. Different orbits along with the satellites and going, uh, blah, 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 distinguishing between the effects of different sources. Oh, man, that's complicated, isn't it? Mm. Uh, although the swarm's main goal is to measure slow changes in the magnetic field, it is apparent that the mission can also detect fast fluctuations in the field. However, the swarm can only do this if one satellite is in close proximity to the active storm and if the lightning is strong enough. So there's a, a picture of sprites. And wow, Perseids, uh, these streaks of Perseid meteorites. So okay. there we um, powerful elf waves can even propagate around the world a few times and still be visible in our recordings. Such powerful sources include sprite associated discharges. Though we know that every lightning strike carries a lot of energy, it's clear that this class of lightning is much more powerful. A single bolt of ordinary lightning, which is invisible to swarms of instruments, carries enough energy to charge 20 electric cars. But the energy produced by TLE is enough to charge 800 cars or vehicles. Changing so, the subject slightly, why are they now saying that they don't want... <laughs> And um, wind farms on land. They don't want that. There's a lot of uh, problem with them, isn't there? People don't want them near them. Oh, you mean when you that mean was wind, Cameron wind turbines brought that ban in? Yeah, yeah that, well, they're wrong about it because the prime minister who got kicked out, she wanted to bring it back in. Yeah, it's been. They are thinking to bring it back in now. But it, pl it plan is against them, isn't it? They, they decided they wouldn't have them. People well, didn't they, want them. They want to them. change the law so that you can have them now. That's the yeah. Point. Yeah, they're trying to. I don't know whether it's working yet. Even there's yeah. a lot of resistance. Be a downside cheaper to put them up than it is putting them out at sea. That's what they were saying. And less than a tenth of the cost. Yeah, um, but will be cheaper. Yeah, and. Um, unlike power stations, you can dismantle them and you leave the land as it was. Yeah. Or, yeah. The forest that would have grown won't be there yet. <laughs> anyway, this is another wind, one. They're very difficult to site, the, these wind turbines. Uh, up at McCuntleth, in these, uh, you know, they say alternative technology place. They've got two up there. They've got two uh, on. Uh, on the hillside above, and one works and one doesn't, and you've got no, to you've got you've got to be really really precise about sighting them. If you go uh, to America, I mean, you drive along the road, and there's hundreds of the things. If it's very flat land, you, you're okay. You, you can be okay. Yeah. But no, I mean, no, people don't want them, do they? Really? Well, what was crazy um, was uh, Rampisham, where they had all all those um, aerial towers. Yeah, they took most of them down and then put up solar panels. Well, if you got all <laughs> those um, aerial towers up, if they could quite easily have replaced them with um, with, me? with wind wind turbines. Yeah, yeah, they got that radio station in Somerset, haven't they? That worldwide radio station, places like that. They could, yeah, I don't know, but there's a lot of opposition to it. Yeah. I mean, if you put them at sea, you've got even wind, haven't you? You've got an even wind. Yeah. But as long I, as you don't put them behind each other, you, you, they're all right. But yeah, but, but the problem with the you, argument is, is we don't want them there because it ruins the countryside. Yeah. But if you don't have them, you're not going to have the countryside because we're all going to be burnt to a bloody frazzle. 
But we're having the biggest one in the world, aren't we, out on Dogger Bank? <coughs> yeah. All right. I don't know. Yeah. Peter's, had, Peter's had somebody at the door, so I don't know how long he's going to be. I've just done a lot, a, a lot of stuff, put a lot of stuff together on that Dogger Bank one. Yeah. Because they, 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 they really want to beggar about with Dogger Bank. They want to fill in the port at Dover or something, a part of the port at Dover. All right. So they want to dig up part of the Dogger Bank, yeah. ship all the sand down to, to Dover, and dump it in the harbour there. I don't know what they're going to do. Right. It's really don't weird. Don't and then they got the fish, they do. They've got fishery problems as the, there. They've got uh, ammunition dumps. There's loads and loads of ammunition dumps and sunken ships with ammunition in them. Yeah, you know, it's all very well. And then when you want to, if you want to make a wind turbine, if you make the, the carbon fibre, it's got to, it's got to be heated up to a thousand degrees to make it. So there's a lot of energy needed to make to make the make the actual construct, you know, to construct them to put into the construction. It's a hell of a lot of. Right. of, of uh, I wonder how many of the people who object to wind farms. If you said, well, you can't have any electricity anymore, we'd actually say, oh, well, we will have them after all. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's all, I mean, it's like solar panels. I mean, you know, what's loads and loads of solar panels? You know, big fields full of solar panels, you know. They're not very attractive, are they? No, I well, mean, when, I, when I was talking to a chap who installed the solar panels at, at the charity I worked at, he said that yeah. you can now get solar panels which are, are patterned to look like grass or leaves yeah yeah, and, yeah that's right and all the tiles yeah. as well can't you yeah so why not put them on you know because you wouldn't see them no i think they're very expensive compared to you know the silica ones uh, but yeah I mean, there's all sorts of different different ways i mean ultimately we've just got to we've just got to cut down on what we use haven't we we if you keep installing electric power like that, people are going to use, want to use more, aren't they? Yes. You true. know, we're going to see that there's going to be no no limit. There's no sort of there'll be no limit to the amount of of, of power that we're going to have to generate because people just want more and more and more, won't they? Yeah, that's right. It's that's the true. use we've got to get at rather than the production. I think. So I don't know. Anyway, this 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 is another one on sprites. There is a sprite, I think. Um, wow, this is rather a nice photograph. Um, the sprite depicted at Jupiter, at Jupiter. So presumably, I don't know what that means. It's an illustration. Jupiter, Jupiter's wow. hydrogen-rich atmosphere is likely to make them appear blue. Oh, I see. It's not a real thing. Hmm. The presence of nitrogen gives them the reddish colour in Earth's atmosphere. Oh, I see. So this is a um, a sprite on. On Neptune, did I say Neptune? Jupiter. 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 Right. Uh, hmm. Wow. Um, <laughs> scientists predict these bright super flash flashes, super fast flashes <laughs> should be present in Jupiter. Um, okay. Interesting to see them, wouldn't it? Their existence remained yeah. theoretical. Then in the summer of 2019, researchers from Juno's ultraviolet spectrum discovered something unexpected, a bright, narrow streak of ultraviolet. And there it is on the photograph below, I think. We had the lightning man over from America to give us a, a talk. And um, we were looking at uh, electrical discharges and uh, he, he He's got a fantastic, he fires rockets up into the air with uh, with copper copper cables attached to them when he sees the right cloud formation and he's, it gets the lightning to strike these, these uh, copper cables and it's really spectacular. Mm. The lightning man, yeah, he's, he, <laughs> <laughs> it just does research into lightning and... Uh, yeah, we had a prob we had a problem up at um you walk up by your side gate. It's all right, it's my window cleaner. Oh right. Okay. That's the chap that came to the front door. Oh right. He's now cleaning my windows. Okay. <laughs> so I'll have to stop again and pay him in a minute when he's finished. Um 
So, uh, uh, named after a quick-witted character in English folklore, sprites are transient luminous events triggered by lightning discharges from thunderstorms far below. On Earth, they occur 60 miles above intense towering thunderstorms. And this what last oh, what is it at the bottom? Almost resembling a jellyfish, sprites feature a central blob of light. On Earth, it's 15 to 30 miles across, with long tendrils extending down uh, towards the ground and upwards. Elves, short for emission of very of light and very low frequency perturbations, um, uh, appear as a flattened disc glowing in the Earth's upper atmosphere. They too brighten the sky for a mere milliseconds and can grow larger than sprites up to 200 miles across. Gosh. Mm. The, their colours are distinctive as well. On Earth, sprites appear reddish in colour due to their interaction with nitrogen. But on Jupiter, the upper atmosphere consists of hydrogen and they would appear blue or pink. There's a lovely little moving thing down the bottom here with Juno swinging around in front of it, I think. Is it interactive? Well, well the, the picture on my computer has gone absolutely mental. Yeah, it's gone I haven't seen anything. You know what? Oh. I can't see like anything it, on my computer. Well, I'll stop sharing for a moment, see what happens. Is that normal? Yeah. Yes. I'll go back to this other screen then, if I can find it. It's all out of focus, I think. Mm. Right. There you go, right. <laughs> Can you see it now again? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah that's better. Oh, yeah. So this is this is the real time, <clears throat> I think. Eleven twenty-seven. Yeah, that's about right. I don't know whether this is a just a obviously not the real thing, is it? What are we looking at? Three giant blades stretching out six feet, six uh, six sided body. The giant said unit. It's going strange oh. again. It's gone again. Oh, I just moved it once, clicked it once. Is it to do with this? Um... Enlarging. Oh, oh, what's happened now? <laughs> Got a blank screen. Ah, this is something going on to something about the NASA Solar System Explorer, all about Juno. Can that you see that? Or no. Is it... no. Oh, yeah. That's right now. That's it. Yeah. No, no, it's gone again. Cracking. Right. Come back. No, gone. Oh. Try the next article and see if there's a problem on this. This, well, this, this is another one. Um, I can go to the next one. I'll, I'll go to this one. Can it, was that a fixed, stable image? No, no it is now. Yeah. Oh, not the size. <clears throat> I thought this has got. You've got one, two, three four five things to look at or you yeah. must six i don't know what you can click on any of those links to see um, whatever it says the system here astronaut asteroids on the earth and so on so they, these are quite fascinating these one there's one on exoplanets <clears throat> so i'll suggest you have a look at that later on oh, yeah. um this was on the uh, Mars 2020 landing. Oh, that's brilliant. When they, yeah, when the parachute opens and all same that. Thing, same, same links again down below. So <clears throat> there's actually quite a lot on this thing to explore if you want to go <laughs> see what's what. Is that NASA? Oh. Yes, it's all NASA, yes. All NASA, yeah. It's called NASA's Eyes. NASA's eyes. Okay. Have a yeah. look at that one. Yeah. And the next one, I think, is oh, this one was fascinating. The World War II uh, shipwreck has leaked many pollutants into the sky, into the sea. I mean, uh, um, and you get these lovely growths. This is a, a ship, I think, damaged by the bomb that hit it midships at some point in the past. Eighty-year-old shipwreck. Um, the wreck is leaking hazardous pollutants, including explosives and heavy metals, influencing the marine microbiology. 
Yeah. Well, they reckon that the um, Arizona that was blown off at Pearl Harbor is still leaking oil oh, into right. the sea, and because it's a um, a, a grave uh, grave site, um, they don't really want to touch it. But they are now talking about get, trying to pump what's left of the oil out of it. Okay, Ken was telling us of another um, boat somewhere yeah. in England or on the coast somewhere that's got full of... Royal Oak. It's the Royal Oak up in Scarpa Flow. Oh, Scarpa Flow, was it? Well, there, there's yeah. an, an we, we had to deal with that. It was leaking oil and the, the oil was coming ashore. And uh, and uh, we, had to, we had to think of a way of getting the oil, collecting the oil. Oh. Uh, so what I suggested was a, like an upside down parachute thing yeah. and then we and it could collect it could concentrate it in the top like a funnel upside down funnel and you could concentrate the oil there collect it i think that's what they put in in the end but those that, ships in the Scarpa flow i mean all the german fleet are up there as well uh, that wasn't the one i was thinking of no uh, some well, like watch isn't there a, a, an ammunition ship that was sunk with a lot of they're afraid that things going to blow up yes and um cause a tsunami wave uh, over africa yeah that's the montgomery oh that's the one i was thinking of the montgomery is just off it's just off um oh uh it's holiday, what's the resort down there south end it's just off south end and um, one of the masks collapsed just a few months ago oh uh, yeah it was and they, were, they wondered if the mass collapsed what it's got, it's got uh, pick, pick rates, and the, the, the picric acid was oh. used in the fuses, ah, and it yes. forms very, very sensitive metal compounds, uh, with iron and, uh, and it, iron especially, and uh, if you just knock it, it will blow, mm. and it will blow all the ammunition. The, 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 it was a Liberty ship, and it's broken in half. But they weren't. They weren't very well. They were made very, very quickly. Those Liberty ships, yes. and uh, a lot of them weren't weren't all that weren't all that good. And this one, it it, it broke in half as when it it landed on the bottom. Mm. So that it's they dared put a diver down though. You couldn't put a diver down. They tried it with another ship that was very similar and had the same ammunition in, and it blew, and there was mm. nothing left of anything. It just it just went up with a colossal explosion. And they say, oh, we're not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteers wanted. <laughs> but we, we used to have a, every every year we used to have we used to have a, a PQ parliamentary question on it that came in uh, at Porton and we had to not at Porton. It was over in uh, at Bath in the with the Navy. And uh, we had to say the same thing, we couldn't do anything about it. We just have to hope to God it doesn't flow. Yes, but if it does, it's sunken ships here. <coughs> it's bloody awful. There's loads of them, though. Yeah, loads, loads of them, yes. <clears throat> well, I'm in Lime Bay as well, I believe. Yeah, oh, there's one in Lime Bay. Yeah, there was an um, oil tanker, wasn't it? Yeah, and there's a few aircraft yeah. in Lime Bay. Yeah. The Channel Dash. Yeah. <clears throat> and in Portland Harbour, <laughs> God, that was a terrible one. The ships used to come back in, into Portland Harbour, and when they came back in, they would discharge all the ammunition that was on board because they didn't want to return it. It was a bit of a rigmarole to return ammunition, so they used to sit there and they used to just eject all the ammunition into the sea, and there were big piles of it. Okay. Whenever the ship had been, there were big piles of ammunition. And uh, I think I remember, some, it, I remember some years ago um, when when naval ships used to um, come into Plymouth, they used to have to turn their guns out to sea um, yeah. and fire them to make sure they were empty. Yeah. Uh, on the Tiger, they rotated the, the turret the wrong way and fired the shell, and it landed up in the dockyard. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. These things will happen, yes, yes. <laughs> they do, yeah. Right, okay, uh, now then, um, anyone heard of um, electric uh, motor airpin windings? 
No, half pin winding. Well, they're the, well, they go around right here, pin bends, won't they? Well, you'll see. <laughs> uh, well, this is a video, I think. Yes. The uh, design of the hairpin windings, uh, we have to uh, we have to follow. Well, it's not the beginning. Uh, let me just go back uh, the producer mind. of the software uh, called MotorCAD. Uh, it's a multi physics friendly element uh, tool for the electric motor design and analysis. As a, a company, uh, we also provide the consultancy uh, uh, services to deliver the electric motor uh, design solutions and analysis for our client. We also participate in some of the UK government funded research uh, projects. Uh, so well, these are uh, electric motors where they have slots where they put the winding in. And instead of making it with a round wire, they're trying to use um, wire that's pre-shaped in the shape of a hairpin and then they mm. can either have them in one little um, loop and then just weld them all together at the end or have a continuous system I mean, I don't know why they don't use a continuous system but that's what that was about so I'm sure there was some on our proper article about it so I got it on the next one no no it must be here so this uh, today's topic is from actually from a research project uh, we've uh, uh, been doing for this year and the last year. It's uh, the modeling and optimization of electric motors with hairpin windings. So here is a, a preview or a overview of these uh, hairpin windings or electric motor with hairpin windings. It uses the preformed conductors to uh, replace the random wound, the convention, uh, conventional one, the uh, wires in the windings. It will provide us some benefit from using that. The first one, we can, use, we can achieve very high fuel factor, uh, can be 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or even higher. And it allows us to do very highly automatic manufacturing process by using the hairpin winding. And because of this uh, very uh, significant benefits or advantages of hairpin winding, this type of uh, winding is becoming very popular in electric vehicle or hybrid electric vehicle driving applications. Uh, for example, the Chevrolet Volt second generation since 2016. Uh, the Toyota Prius since fourth generation and uh, recently the uh, fifth, uh, fifth generation uh, uh, from 2015. And the Chevrolet Bolt 2016, they are also all using the hairpin winding uh, technologies for their electric motors. And uh, talking about uh, the hairpin winding, we can divide that into two types of uh, uh, windings uh, in terms of the production process. The first one is the axial insert hairpin. So the process is like uh, we shape the uh, long uh, copper wire into this hairpin shape. And uh, we, then we assemble that hairpins into the stator slots through so this axial direction. And then for uh, forming the wave for well, the wave uh, winding, we twist each of the end of, uh, of the uh, hairpin and then we weld that to form that uh, wave or winding. So in this process, welding is uh, required to connect, uh, connect the hairpins. So the more conductors we have, the more time consuming this process becomes. Uh, in, uh, due to the industrial experience, a rough maximum uh, feasible solution is around 72 slots, eight winding layers. And another type of uh, hairpin winding is the radially insert hairpin is also called continuous hairpin winding. It will shape the long copper wire into the wave winding, uh, a whole wave winding. And then we can assemble this whole wave winding into the data uh, slot through this slot opening. So radially, so that's why it called uh, the radially insert hairpin. 
So you can see in this process, the welding and the twisting process is not required. So we can save a lot of effort and time. And the advantage and the disadvantages yeah. of helping welding. You probably heard enough about that now, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was um, interesting that they are still developing electric motors after all this time. Yeah. <laughs> you can buy them on Amazon. Sorry? You can buy them on Amazon. Oh, I'm sure, yes. It's a, I'm sure it's a common thing these days, but I've yeah. so many new types of electric motors since I left college. I mean, Brilliant. Dozens of them, it seems. Yeah. This is just one variety. Anyway, <clears throat> batteries are the same, aren't they? There's so many different types of batteries, it's untrue. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> uh, this is our local lass, isn't she? I think Becky Smithhurst. Um, talking about black. She has her little, her little website, um, YouTube site, I mean, and she talks animatedly about all sorts of things, including brief history of black holes there. Um, if you don't know who she is, she's quite... It's the space between too. galaxies of stars when they're clustered together. When two galaxy clusters collide, all the gas that fills the space between the galaxies in the cluster also collides as well, transferring energy. It heats up and it even starts to glow and give off X-ray light that we can detect with X-ray telescopes. Now, this is a really famous image of the bullet cluster, which is two galaxy clusters that have collided. And coloured pink there in the middle is the hot X-ray emission from the gas that's collided right where the two galaxy clusters impacted each other. What you'll notice though is that the galaxies of stars, however, are on either side of that, essentially having flown right through each other with no two stars colliding. If we then look at the gravitational effects that this cluster has, say for example on light coming from galaxies behind it. Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that massive objects curve space-time, so light travelling across that curved space-time will have its path bent. And you see distant galaxies looking like arcs in a process known as gravitational lensing. So if we do that with the bullet cluster and look where the majority of the mass is concentrated, first of all, we find that it's about <coughs> 10 times more mass than we can account for in stuff that we can see with gas and stars. And B, that if we map it out, we get this blue coloured region. That's where all the dark matter is. And in the collision, it followed the galaxies of stars. It too sailed on through and didn't get stuck in the middle like the gas did. It is collisionless. So why is this such a big deal for the growth of black holes? Well, collisions is the only process that we know of to stop stuff just orbiting a black hole and actually fall in and contribute to the growth and add to a black hole's mass. Gas that gets too close to a black hole will be pulled into orbit, into what's known as an accretion disk. The black hole is spinning, so it's like taking a bowl of pizza dough and, you know, setting it spinning above your head. It, it flattens out into a disk. Problem is, the gas in that disk is just on a happy orbit around that black hole and will continue on that orbit forevermore unless you have collisions of two particles that can exchange energy. Again, just like back to our balls on a pool table. Sometimes you can play a shot where the cue ball completely stops and transfers all its energy to the other ball. The same thing can happen in the accretion disk around a black hole with particles. You can have two particles that collide, one of which gains all the energy and probably can escape from the accretion disk because you know we're near the actual event horizon of the black hole at that point of no return. But the other one, loses all its energy and all of a sudden it can't maintain that orbit around the black hole and so it does fall in beyond the event horizon and contribute to the mass of the black hole. That is how this process of accretion works and it's how black holes grow. But dark matter is collision-less, so if some dark matter gets pulled into that accretion disk as well, then it's just going to get stuck there because it can't collide with anything else to exchange energy so it actually falls in and instead will just remain on an orbit. 
the only way you could maybe get dark matter into a black hole is if it happened to fall in on exactly the right trajectory and hit the bullseye, essentially. So groups that have attempted to simulate this process happening suggest that it could account for a maximum of about 10% of supermassive black hole's mass if conditions were just right it's much likely that it's less than that. Combine that with the fact that black holes are bald and we could never test whether black holes actually do contain dark matter. By bald, I'm referring to what's known as the no hair theorem that states that essentially the only three parameters that you can measure about a black hole is its mass, its charge, and its speed. Bin. Essentially, all other information is erased. Like, for example, what element the matter that's fallen into that black hole actually was. So you could never say whether a black hole is made of 80% hydrogen and 10% helium or 10% dark matter. All of that information is erased beyond the event horizon. So we can't test any of these simulations. If you, if you tied her hands down, mm -hmm. would she be unable to speak? <laughs> I wonder about that, yeah. Anyway, what do you think of her, um, Ken? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, you've got to keep your hands still, bloody new. It's most it, off-putting. But what she's saying is quite pertinent, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah it's quite, quite good. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next one, I think. You find your black matter, and that dark matter, that fellow's already said it doesn't exist, has yeah, well, we're talking to each other. <laughs> Good question. I don't know. <clears throat> this one is: uh, Can super hot rock energy be delivered at scale? Uh, somebody sent me this. Was it? Was it Peter? No. Uh, no, it wasn't me. No. Oh, sure, somebody. It may sound like an '80s tribute band, but super hot rock energy. It's all about tapping into the extreme heat emanating from the Earth's core. If it can be developed at scale, it could hold the key to providing abundant, clean electricity and become a key weapon in the battle against climate change. The US government wants to help commercialize super hot rock technology by cutting its costs by 90% by 2035, as part of Joe Biden's pledge to hit net zero by 2050. Geothermal energy drives generator turbines without burning fossil fuels. Conventional projects rely on water heated by the Earth's core rising through fissures and fractures in permeable rock, and using the resulting reservoirs of pressurized hot water. But these only tend to occur in areas of tectonic activity. Enhanced geothermal systems, on the other hand, allow engineers to drill down into solid rock almost anywhere injecting water at high pressure and allowing that water to pass through the rock and back up to the surface through another well. It seeks to tap into the deepest and hottest rock possible, close to the Earth's core. At super high heat, the performance of geothermal energy takes a dramatic leap. A project using water at 200 degrees has a 5 megawatt capacity, while a super hot rock project using 400 degree water would result in a 50 megawatt capacity. Turning up the heat by 42% results in 10 times more power, paving the way for cheaper, zero emission electricity. And unlike wind and solar, super hot rock can provide energy 24 hours a day, 365 days a year from anywhere in the world, if engineers can get to it. One idea being trialed is melting rock with laser beams. Production of super hot rock isn't up and running, but exploration is ongoing. The world's first demonstration site is being run by a company called Alterock in Oregon. Still, this burgeoning new technology requires money, research, and the resolution of technical challenges. But if Washington can encourage the billions of dollars of investment that super hot rock energy development requires, it could enjoy top billing along with the more established acts of the renewable energy lineup in the decades ahead. Yeah, wasn't that exciting? <laughs> it's just a heat pump, isn't it? Well, yes, but they're getting down to where the temperature is so hot that you can't put normal metals down there without them melting. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I don't know, I don't know. 
there's lots of hot places, aren't there? I mean, is it coal mines? They're doing coal mines in the Midlands, aren't they? Yes. Getting yes. heat from coal mines and uh, using that for. Uh, and then you've got this geothermal in Southampton, but that that's not. I don't know if that's working or not. Yeah, they've got a borehole there which goes down into hot water. Oh, I see. So that's exactly what there was. This chap was saying then. Yes. Yeah, and but. but Something went wrong with the pump. I think the pump broke, and they had to get a special pump from Sweden, ah. which is sort of it's a, it, it's a slim <coughs> slim pump, especially designed for that purpose, and I think they were very expensive. But it's not, it wasn't working when when we went to it, and they had a big diesel engine instead, which right. rather rather spoilt the the whole thing really. Okay, right. Now, my last uh, entry for today is one about dark matter, but uh, interestingly oh, done, as, ah. you, as you will see. We'll get to the bottom of this, won't we? Sorry? <laughs> we'll get Are to you the ready? Of dark matter. Are you ready? <laughs> ready. <laughs> hey, B. Yeah? What are we made of? Ah, uh, this again. Don't you ever wonder where ghosts come from? We come from people, Scott. Yeah, but what are we? I mean, what is this? Why can we float through walls? I don't know. People can't float through walls. What's your point? Well, I've been doing some research. Uh, and I think I know. What do you think we're made of? Dark matter. Dark matter. We float through walls, B. Dark matter floats through walls. So does Wi-Fi. Maybe we're made of the internet. No, we did that one already. It's right here on the list. We're definitely not made of feathers, hot dogs, the internet. Okay, okay, but you think we are made of dark matter? Because we can float through walls? I'm just saying, follow the evidence. The evidence? Think about it. How long have we been haunting the CVS parking lot? I don't know, a hundred years, maybe two hundred? Does saying that make you feel old? No. Right, because you're an ethereal being condemned to roam the netherworld, consumed by your regrets until the end of time. You don't age. Guess what else doesn't age? Dark matter. Exactly. Can you believe it's 14 billion years old? It looks great. It doesn't look like anything. You can't see it. You can't see it. <laughs> Nobody can see it. It doesn't reflect light. Your face can't see it. <laughs> your face. Ghosts can't be made of dark matter, Scott. I know. It's hard to believe. No, it's impossible. What do you mean? We can see each other. You can't see dark matter. You can't see dark matter. Nobody can see dark matter. Also, we're talking to each other. Dark matter... Doesn't have a mouth? No, it does not have a mouth. <laughs> Mouths are funny. But even if it did have a mouth, it couldn't talk. When you talk, you make sound waves that travel through the air. Dark matter can't manipulate air like that. It floats right through air, just like it floats through walls. We float through walls. Scott, what's the first thing that happens when we float near some people? Before or after we rattle the doorknobs. What? Who cares? Let's say after. The people feel a creeping sense of dread and a sudden sharp awareness of their own mortality. Before that. They shiver. <laughs> right. They get cold. That wouldn't happen if we were made of dark matter. Why not? Because dark matter doesn't affect the temperature of what's around it. So dark matter doesn't make people cold. No. It doesn't touch the air. Right. And it doesn't have a mouth. Yes. But we do? Yes. Okay, but... What? You're stuck on the walls thing? It just makes sense. Scott, dark matter doesn't just float through walls. It floats through itself, too. It doesn't stick together like the stuff that makes planets and stars and walls and people and ghosts. But it has so much mass, so much gravity, that it collapsed in on itself after the Big Bang and regular matter coalesced around it. Dark matter is like a giant web that connects everything else in the universe. A web? Like a spider web? Mm. Kinda. Are we made of spiders? Maybe. I'm putting it on the list. Definitely <laughs> different. Yeah. <laughs> That's a limit. <laughs> and now you know, ghosts are made of dark matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If only, yeah. Well, an amusing little thing to end with. <laughs> yeah. I've just sent you one, Peter. You... Oh, hold on. Let me uh, see if I can find on it. On ship contrails. Um, inbox. Got to go to my inbox, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, what was it called? 
It's ship contrails. Oh. I've not come through yet. You know, they've got air, 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 um, you know, air, aircraft contrails, so they ship, they've probably got ship contrails as well now. Mm. So the ship leaves a contrail behind it. Oh, <laughs> it's the good old days. They used to oh, call got, them paper trails. Oh, I've got I don't it. Be, able to, be able to see them. It should come to, anyway, there's a link there. Okay, I'm just going to click on it now and I'm going to yeah. top it so much on my what, other. Um, see what comes up. Should have, again. I've got a share screen here. Where are we? Down here, I think. Share screen is, uh, where are we? There. And it's this one. And then it's that one. So it should be, oh, hold on. Should be here. Is it, can you see it by any chance? Yeah, it's from nature. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I'm trying to enlarge it now. I'm just trying to think which bit to click. That bit there, I suppose. Yes, that's it. Right. Um, get rid of the, all this stuff at the bottom. Um, invisible ship's tracks show large cloud sensitivity to aerosol. Right, is there a nice video down here? Oh, no, not really. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Chilean, Chilean scum. Deck from Modis satellite instrument. So they're finding trails of ships after they've gone. Yeah. The ship track leaves a track behind it. Oh, get away. Weird, isn't it? Yes, it's, I don't know how long it persists. There are clouds. No, I came across it the other day and I had to have a look at it. But yeah, property. So they, they come and then fade away, I suppose. But it's another sort of, you know, meteorological right. phenomenon which could could affect global warming. Oh, um, really? Oh. Well, yeah, yeah, because the uh, contrails from aircraft uh, they re reflect. Now, if you get something high enough, high enough up in the atmosphere, it reflects heat back. And if you yeah. get it lower in the atmosphere, it traps heat. Yes, I see. Yes. Yeah. That's how it works. Uh, there's a balance, isn't there, between the two as to what you get in um, what the effect is on the atmosphere. It goes on a bit, this article, doesn't it? Oh, oh yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, OK. There's one or two more there. The, um, Methane oh, yeah, and yeah, Siberia and uh, Tibetan t Plateau and floods and drought in risk management. So they've got a, you know, there's a section on that. I, I think it's quite, quite reasonable. There's, a, there's a, some more here, I suspect. Extra, extra evapotranspiration. That's a good word. Mm. Can you say it? Impact, impact acceleration. The trees, trees give off give, give off more water during droughts. Oh right, yeah, do they? Yeah, which is a bit of a bummer, isn't it? Because you'd expect them to close down. You would. Well, they, they do. They probably do it. They probably do it to to uh, cool themselves down. I don't know. Maybe yeah. Surface warming in global cities is substantially more rapid in rural background areas. And then you got offshore wind farms. On the near surface, on the effect of them on the climate as well. They, they've all got an effect on something. This is a terrible website you've got here. All sorts of horrible things happening to the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's, that's the world, isn't it? It's the world we live in. Nobody <laughs> bloody believes it, but it's the world we live in. Yeah, which which uh, website is it? I can't find it. It's out. Nature. It's from Nature. The articles from Nature. Oh, nature portfolio, right? Yeah. Nature. Oh, I see. You can download them. I see. This is port. The PDFs at the top. Yeah, download the PDFs from different, different things. Yeah, there we go. You can see it's at the top now. I couldn't get to it before. Right. Oh, interesting. Right. Well, it's midday. Time for me to stop the recording.